Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you stream your video content, all on the 810 outlets, Facebook, YouTube, all that. We appreciate you having us today. You can see our beautiful faces. I am Nate Bucati on the back deck again, guys. And I will tell you just a little window into the, the Bucati world. The pandemic has caused me to spend so much time into like decorating the back deck in fall season type stuff, you know. Um, and I'll let you know over here, we've got my friend Reggie and his dog uh, Peanut. I don't know oh if you guys can. Gosh, I nice. love it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that dog ears actually were part of the skeleton, but um, found yeah, out. Yeah, I thought ears were cartilage. Am I? Yeah, I did too. I did too. Learning anatomy here as we. But go. it would also look kind of weird though if the dog didn't have the ears. So <laughs> yeah, when I design guess. is more important than anatomy, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm pretty impressed with how uh, accurate the skeleton anatomy seems to be, though. So. Uh, the kids named him Reggie and the dog Peanut. Not sure how either of those came about, but um, that's what we got. So, great um, I, I got Trost. My two pumpkins. Hey, are those real? Are those real pumpkins? Those are real pumpkins. So we need to monitor the situation to ensure they don't start going bad uh, right on the floor of our living room. So yeah. that will be uh, something to keep an eye on. And as long as you don't carve them, they should be fine for quite a while. Yes. So probably how's the no fruit carving. fly not... situation? Okay, Nate. I tweeted about this earlier. I actually, Amazon ordered the little traps that you had sent the link to or sent a yep. screenshot of. They got back ordered, but it seems to have not mattered because ever since I tweeted out about a week ago that I was having a fruit fly situation, they've disappeared. They, they saw the thread on Twitter. They got freaked out and they said, let's guys, let's here. find a new apartment. We're going to bounce. <laughs> Uh, so no fruit flies in the last couple of days and nothing's really changed. So I don't know, again, outside of the tweet, Seems like the likeliest of, uh, yeah. of reasons that they are no longer here. So all's Carter, good over here. Carter, yeah. how's your fruit, fruit fly situation at your house? Um, you know, I actually did have some earlier in the summer. I feel like a lot of people have been getting them, but um, it didn't last very long. I didn't have an aggressive press strategy like like Allie to uh, intimidate, <laughs> intimidate them in, in the press. But uh, yeah, we're, we're good on the fruit flies. Well, for, you know, a free advertising for Taro uh, Pest Control, but they make these little fruit fly apples. They're, they're shaped like little plastic apples, and you fill them with this, like, vinegar-based substance. Take care of your fruit flies like that. I keep a couple of them going at all times in our house, uh, and, and fruit fly population in our house is always under control. Nice. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the more you know, guys. Well, hey, mine will be coming – I think this week, so I, I might put them out for preventative measures, but. Right about the time uh, those or, pumpkins rot, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, my strategy is either, you know, get ahead of the case before it, it even happens or just bully them online and see what. See there you go, happens. yeah. <laughs> Cyberbullying is okay if it's fruit flies. That's the only time. <laughs> it's the only time it's acceptable, but it is because it's us or them. That's, that's what it boils down True. to. True. Um, all right, let's get into the show. We've got a busy show today, and it's going to be a really fun show. Up next on the show, we're going to have Tom Marshall join us. He is the reporter for Mexican soccer, basically, the Mexican national team, the Mexican League, Liga MX, um, for ESPN. You can follow him on Twitter, at Mexico World Cup. We're going to talk with him about the landscape of the Mexican national team that Alan Polito is walking into. That's obviously some news we're going to cover through the course of the show today as the Mexican national team have some friendlies coming up in this window and Alan Polito will be joining them for those friendlies. So I think that'll be interesting to see, okay, where does Alan Polito fit in Tata Martino's plans? How important is this little window for him? And what should we watch for if we're going to watch these uh, Mexican national team games? So he'll join us in the next segment. And then we're going to talk to our old friend, Tony Miola, legendary Kansas City Wizards goalkeeper, uh, national broadcaster for all things soccer, and now part of the Chicago Fire uh, television crew. So he'll be on their call for the Chicago Fire versus Sporting Kansas City game on Wednesday night, and uh, he'll give us a little inside peek at the Chicago Fire organization. They've had a lot of changes, 17 new players, new manager, all that. So it's going to be really informative. And a new, a new opponent, somebody we haven't seen yet. We, we feel like we really know the teams Sporting's played a lot up until this point. So a couple of really good guests 
coming up on the show today. Uh, we have a big game, 2-1 victory over the Houston Dynamo to recap from this past weekend. And we have two games coming up this week to get ready for. As I mentioned, Chicago Fire at Children's Mercy Park on Wednesday. And then Nashville. We got an FC and an SC. If I remember that correctly, Carter, I've got to keep track of who the FCs and SCs are. I think Chicago fires the FC and Nashville's an SC. Do I have that right? I believe so. Correct. That's important stuff. Um, and I know which way Carter feels about those two things. So team Nashville for Carter on that. <laughs> so um, let's, let's rewind guys first to the game uh, against Houston Dynamo. And, and it, this is one of those, those moments in time. I was just, con- I was just uh, trying to explain the concept of bittersweet to my children this past weekend. And I feel like perfect example, Alan Polito <laughs> as he comes back from injury. Sporting's been wanting to have him back. They plunked all this money down for him, and he went out and showed, hey, this is exactly what you paid for. I'm the best player on this field. All I need is two chances, and I'm going to score two goals. And then the very next day, he's out of here, going to the U.S. or to the Mexican national team. Uh, so definitely a bittersweet situation. Uh, but, Ali, I'll start with you. Your thoughts on the performance by Sporting Kansas City as a whole, and, uh, and what did you make of the performance by Alan Polito? Yeah, well, I mean, let's just start with Alan Polito. He is exactly as advertised, and he just really proved exactly what was missing from the sporting team for the stretch of games that he was out dealing with the knock. And, and of course, like you said, it is very bittersweet now that he returns and will be gone again for the majority of the month of October, about five to six games is what Vermees said, but just what he's able to do when he, when he is on the ball, beautiful things happen. And Vermees pointed this out after the game. Those aren't goals that just every player would score in those positions. They're very hard angles. It's not an easy um, situation to be in, whether you are forward, midi, or, you know, anyone in that kind of goal scoring situation. So I just think that Alan Polito is absolutely what this team has been missing. I know that Felipe Gutierrez is another player that's been out, you know, this entire season really and has also been missed but Alan Polito man it's just it's going to be really tough not having him uh, for this next stretch of games but overall I thought I thought the performance from sporting was great again though without Alan Polito on the field who knows how that game would have ended up as far as you know results go and I think that's where the concern lies now moving forward is you know this is a team that had been struggling to find the back of the net had either out possessed teams or had a lot of great opportunities, but opportunities and, and possessing the ball doesn't necessarily result in a win. So I think that this team is going to definitely struggle in the next couple of games, not, you know, as a collective unit, but just not having a, such a, a threatening piece like Alan Polito to, you know, just such a clinical finisher. So I, I thought all in all a good game. They struggled in the first half. I thought, you know, Houston uh, kind of had their way with them for the, you know, majority of the first half. And, and really it was fortunate that Sporting Kansas City was able to pull off such a close win like they were able to. Uh, but it was also very rewarding given how difficult it's been for Sporting to find wins like that one uh, for this last, you know, month of games or so. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, Polito, two great goals, two great balls in from Busio as well. And I mean, that second goal from Polito, and I got a chance to ask him about it. And, and he said, you know, I was, I saw the, the, how the goalie was coming out and in my mind, I wanted to get it to that back post, but that's such a difficult skill. And, and he's, it looks like he's, you know, he slides with the intent to chip it. You know, it's like a slide shot. He knew going in what he was going to do. Ridiculous goal. Um, and yet, like you said, Al, he's a match winner. And I think that's five goals, four assists now and nine starts. I think, you know, he came on as a sub uh, against Orlando as well, but that's a pretty good rate and a pretty good return. So they'll, they'll definitely miss him. But um, I think what buoyed me and the confidence maybe of the team, first of all, you know, some tough results at home. So you get the win on the road, huge. But in talking to Tim Mealy afterwards, he wanted, I asked him about the performance and he wanted to single out like every single player. It felt like so many players had good games down there. And yeah, you have Polito uh, making the headlines, being the match winner. Buzio with the, with the great passes and the attack looked decent. But um, this is a Houston team that had really carved sporting up in a couple games previous. And I think Ilya was absolutely fantastic in this game, uh, left to right all over the pitch. And so for me, Houston didn't have a whole lot of clear cut chances as, as compared to 
maybe the first couple times that uh, th that sporting has played Houston after the the uh, MLS's back tournament. So um, I, I think that's I think that's a, a pretty good sign for things to come. He he helped protect the back line. I think the two center backs worked pretty well for the most part. Of course, they'll be disappointed conceding a set piece goal, but just looked a little more solid from back to front as well. Turn my mic back on. I, I was trying to keep the wind out of your guys' headsets there. Um, all great points. Big win for Sporting Kansas City. Uh, the one thing I, I think I'll add, and we'll, we'll talk about how they replace or, or at least make up for the loss of Polito while he's gone here in a moment. Um, for me, maybe it's a little bit of each, each guy's going to have to do a little bit more. And I think we see a tendency – when you have a, a world-class player on the field, sometimes you can almost sit back and watch him. Like that first goal was get the ball to him and everybody just watch him go to work. And everybody kind of has that innate understanding when he's not on the field that we can't just sit back and watch anybody. We all have to do a little bit more and, and we'll see about that when we come back. We're going to go ahead and take a break. We'll have Tom Marshall to talk about where Alan Polito fits in this Mexican national team. What's at stake for him in these friendlies and more. That's all straight ahead on the Sporting Kansas City Show. And we continue with another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on a busy week here on Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you stream the video content, whether that's on the 810 Facebook page or YouTube page, all of those things. And uh, we are joined by a very special guest now, Tom Marshall, who if you are looking to – really get good information in following the Mexican national team, following Liga MX. He's the Mexican national team and Liga MX reporter for ESPN FC. You can follow him on Twitter at Mexico World Cup. And uh, he joins us now. Tom, how are you, man? Thanks for joining us. No, thanks, Nate. Thanks for the invite. It's good to, uh, good to, be, good to be here. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the international break. First, first one in a long time, it feels like. I feel like most people that have an English accent are never looking forward to the international break. All I ever <laughs> hear is they complain that there's a break in the EPL season and all that. Uh, by the way, I want to get into this before we start talking about the Mexican national team. For our audience that maybe don't know you, I have to admit, I've always been intrigued. I hear a guy with, uh, with an English accent <laughs> talking about Mexican soccer, and I've always wondered the story. How did a man from Manchester end up as the – Mexico World Cup Twitter account and, and all of that. It was a big master plan. When I was five years old, I decided that, uh, you know, this is my path in life. No, I'm only, <laughs> <laughs> only joking. I mean, no, I just finished, finished university and, you know, I did uh, international relations, Latin American studies. And I don't know, basically I started, I wrote to newspapers all over Latin America asking for an opportunity, basically an experience. And the idea was to obviously learn Spanish and Obviously, being from Manchester, you just you know you grow up so much with the game that the, the when I got the job a job working for a newspaper in Guadalajara, basically I don't know I just started my own blog on Mexican Mexican soccer, started writing about it, going to the games, writing about the national team, and then I don't know like like it wasn't a big plan or anything, just bit by bit people started saying you know do you want to do a bit of this and you know I think Goal.com and and kind of Associated Press and then MLS Soccer and. I don't know, it just kind of, then ESPN and it just kind of built up and I just realized, you know, there's not, there's not many people really doing this. So, so it's, you know, it's good little kind of thing to do, you know, and especially with the States up there. And you know, I'm sure you, you guys have seen with Alan Pulido and the, the interest that there's been, you know, the, just the intensity of the interest that there is in the United States on about the Mexican game. And I think, you know, I've just been lucky, I think, to be in, be in the right place at the right time for it. So this is who you cover, but what teams do you root for? I'm always curious people's allegiance when it comes to cheering for different teams. Yeah, I grew up going to Man United. Um, so yeah, so so yeah, United and also my local team, Rochdale. I used to kind of sell programs outside, stuff like that. And then I don't know, in Mexico, it's like, I don't know, I, I lived in Guadalajara for like 10 years. So, you know, I always like seeing Chivas and Atlas doing well. Um, but yeah, I think in Mexico, it's difficult when you don't, you're not brought up with a team to really kind of, I don't know, like find that passion, you know? Um, so yeah, I just like the teams that, I know it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but the teams that, you know, play the best football. <laughs> so uh, having been covering the Mexican game now for 12 years, um, we had a chance when, when Sporting was playing down in the CONCACAF Champions League, we got to go to a Champions League at Tig game at Tigres 
um, the night before our game. And then we were obviously able to see the, the wonderful stadiums with Toluca and Monterey. I'm curious, um, what are some of your favorite places to watch a match in, in Liga MX? Yeah, I mean, honestly, for like, if you're just coming in and, and just for, for like one day, I think you have to go to the Azteca. I mean, it's just like, you know, I, I must have been there, I don't know how many times now, you know, probably 50 times or something. But, you know, you walk up those stairs and it's like, I don't know, the stadium opens up and you get kind of goosebumps and it's like, you know, Maradona, Pelé. I mean, that's where they were crowned. I mean, we talk about the best players ever in the world and they were both crowned on in that stadium at the, you know, the 1970 and 86 World Cup. And so just for the history of that stadium and just the size of it, it just kind of, even now it kind of, you know, you, you have to, you have to take a breath sometimes. So, so yeah. And, and then apart from that, I think for atmosphere, Tigres, absolutely brilliant. Uh, when, when that gets full, uh, I like Toluca quite a lot as well. Very like, small and intense um and, and Monterrey Stadium for me competes with and the same with Chivas to be honest it competes with you know a Champions League stadium in Europe I mean those two stadiums are absolutely amazing places to go, to go and watch a game as well so we're visiting with Tom Marshall and and we're going to get to the MLS side of this equation here in a second but I am curious being there for 12 years and being from England um I think those of us in the United States probably have that chip on our shoulder that they, they, don't, they don't take us too seriously. They, they, and I think that has changed, and we can talk about that in a second, that it is maybe starting to become more uh, respected, you know, American soccer over across the Atlantic Ocean. What about the Mexican League? Like, what was, what was your uh, opinion of Mexican soccer before you went there? Has it changed? And what do you think that the, I don't know, like the European world views uh, Mexican soccer on the national team and, uh, and, and you know, club level? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a big, big question, but I'd say in general terms, it's not changed that much. I think Mexico, I think they're known for playing really good football. You know, if, I think if, around the world, if, you know, whenever Mexico goes into a World Cup, it's like Mexico going to be a really good team to watch. I mean, it's rare that you see a Mexican team, and, and I think it translates into Liga MX as well. It's rare that you see a Mexican team sit back, wait for the opposition, and kind of try and hit on counters. And, you know, the Mexican teams in general like to have the ball. They like to pass the ball out from the back. And basically, they like to play in general terms, you know, good good soccer. Um, and I don't think that's changed kind of too much. And I think the other side of it, which is a, the more negative side, is that if you're being brutally on, honest, probably the Mexican game, and especially the national team, it doesn't have the teeth. You know, it's like a team that everybody respects, everybody likes. But when it comes down to it, if you're a Brazil, if you're an Argentina, you know, a Germany, if it comes down to a, a, a you round a 16 game in the World Cup, you'll probably like to play Mexico. It's the challenge for the Mexican game, how do you get to that kind of higher level, that regular top 10 of the rankings? Well, Tom, just to move over now on the, the big news of the week, especially for Sporting Kansas City with Alan Polito being called up for Mexican national team duty. He's one of three MLS players to get the call. And now manager Peter Vermees has to figure out a way to, uh, to make do without him, even though they've, they've done that with injuries that he's faced this season. It's still an entirely different team when he's on the field. So I guess just from your perspective, you know, what does Polito, you know, help bring to this national team? How does he fit into the mix? But then also, you know, if you've watched any of, you know, the games he's played with Sporting Kansas City this season, how big is that hole for Kansas City? No, I mean, I honestly, I've been really, really happy about, you know, what Polito has done up there because I think there was a question mark. I don't think in terms of ability, but, but, you know, the, the, there was that question mark. You go from a club like Chivas, which is just the intensity of kind of like you, the only play with Mexican players. You know, they claim to have 40 million fans, you know, in, in North America. I mean, this is a, one of the biggest clubs in the world, arguably. I don't think that's an exaggeration. And, you know, I'm not saying sporting Kansas City isn't a big deal, but to, to, to go to that change, there's always that question mark for a Mexican player that, you know, is he going there because, you know, he can make some good money, he can kind of, it's a bit more chilled out kind of lifestyle, or, or what are his reasons for going there? And I think, obviously, he said the right things, but it's what you do on, on the field. And I think Polido, you know, we know off the field, he likes his kind of haircuts, he likes his sports cars, he likes his Instagram stories and, to, you know, be talking to people on there. And, and you know, fair play to him though when it when it's got down to it and I think that the manager Peter Vermes as well has said it every opportunity this is a guy who absolutely every training session is there working hard um and so I'm happy for him because 
I think the, he's deserved this national team call up. And I honestly think now, now, now he's kind of got his foot in the door because he's not been called up by Tata Martino before. I think now he's got the, his foot in the door. He, I mean, he's in the mix. He's in the mix for, for a regular spot. I mean, you know, if you look at the Mexican national team, you've got Raul Jimenez playing at Wolves and he's just number one. There's nobody's getting, nobody's getting near him in the next, you know, in, in the near future. But I think behind that, I think Alan Pulido now is, I mean, you, I mean, you guys watch Chicharito in LA Galaxy and he's not had a good time. I mean, let's be honest. He's, if you're judging Chicharito on just what he's done this year, then he's not a national team player. Obviously, he's the highest, you know, he's the highest goal scorer ever in the history of the national team. That obviously has some weight as well. But right now, if, you, if you're comparing Polito and Chicharito, then obviously you're going to go with Polito. And I think Tata Martino, you know, that's what he's done this in the, with this call-up. Do you think there's any chance he could play with Jimenez? Or is that kind of, he'll, he would more be just a, a backup type player? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's one or the other. I think, I think Tata, Tata Martino is going to play with only one number nine. Um, I think that's what he's done mainly throughout his career as well. And, you know, unless you, you shift Polito to the wing, um, which, I, you know, I just don't see happening then. And I think it's very much a, a Jimenez or Polito. But to be honest, I think Polito's game is suited to, you know, playing on his own up front as well. I mean, I think, I don't know. I think one of the debates in Mexico about Polito has been for a long time, he was just considered number nine. You know, he's just this nine who judged off his goals. And I think especially in his time at Chivas the last couple of years, or he, I don't know, I think, we, I think we understood that, you know, he is more of a rounded player. He does drop back. He does kind of, you know, he can, he can play passes. He can, you know, hold the ball up with his back to goal. And um, yeah, I think, that, um, I, th I think that he is quite suited to, to that number nine role and arguably more than someone like Chicharito, who's very much, a, you know, in the box, making runs in behind kind of player. Hey, Tom, before we let you go, um, and this is all great insight on, on Polito's journey, I think for sporting fans, they're excited that, you know, he said he wanted to get on the national team when he got here, and, and so they're excited to see he's had the success and gotten that opportunity. Obviously, it's tough in a COVID world where you have to also quarantine when you get back, so it increases the number of games you're missing. And when you talk about the fact that he's probably the second choice at the number nine, and the fact that these are friendlies, um, that you're going to possibly miss those games on, that's tough for the fans to swallow – how much of a chance do you think he's going to play in these friendlies at all? And, I, and, and maybe if you could give us a landscape, sounds like maybe they're going to be missing some other players who have had positive COVID tests. What kind of a roster are the Mexican team looking at for these friendlies? Yeah, I mean, it's been difficult for Tata Martino to put the roster together, but it is actually pretty strong. I mean, I don't think it's any weaker than, I mean, you always have injuries and you have issues. And, you know, there's news today, Carlos Rodriguez is out because he's tested positive for, for COVID-19. But I think in general terms, this is, this is pretty much as strong as it gets for, for, for the Mexican national team. Um, and I think Polito will play. I mean, I don't think Tata Martino will have, will have brought him all the way over to Europe and just and sit him on the bench. I mean, I don't, I don't think he's necessarily going to start against the Netherlands, but I, I think he's got a really good shot at starting against Algeria. Um, so I expect him to start that game, you know, as the number nine. And, and to be honest, you know, I think obviously it really sucks from the Sporting Kansas City view, but from Polito's point of view, and, and knowing Tata Martino, he's very, very, you know, he's, he's quite a dis disciplinarian. It's kind of black and white how he sees things. It's like you're with us or, you, or you're not. And I think Polito needed to go. I, mean, I honestly think, mm -hmm. I think him, not just from his personal point of view, but he needed to show that Tata Martino, that he's absolutely 100% dedicated to this national team. Um, and, and basically, I think he, he realizes that the opportunity is there. I mean, like I said, you've got Jimenez, then behind him, you've got, you know, Chicharito, you've got Henry Martin from, from Club America, a couple of youngsters, Macias, um, Santiago Jimenez from Cruz Azul. But nobody's kind of established themselves as that number two right now in, in the striking role. So I think Polido absolutely had to go. Um, and, and I think more than, you know, more than the other, other MLS players that have gone, you know, Pizarro from Miami and, and Jonathan Dos Santos from, from, from the Galaxy. I think Polido, he needs, to, he needs to have a really good camp. And, and if he does have a good camp, then I'm sure that um, moving forward, he, he, if he carries on doing what he's doing for Sporting Kansas City, then he's going to be, you know, he's going to be more of a regular in the national team again. It, it makes perfect sense. And, and you can understand the, the viewpoint for sure. Like you said, he, he's trying to work his way back in, and this is a great opportunity. And we don't begrudge him that. that that's certainly uh, the case. Hey, Tom, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. Hopefully we can talk to you again real soon. Definitely. No, yeah. Thanks a lot for the invite.
All right, that is Tom Marshall. Again, you can follow him at Mexico World Cup on Twitter. Great coverage of the Mexican national team and Liga MX as well. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Big Tones, our guy Tony Miola, to help us preview the Chicago Fire right after this on the Sporting Kansas City Show. And we're back with the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, and wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you stream your video content. And a man who was – once a weekly uh, guest on, on our morning show on Sports Radio 810, had his own show at night on Sports Radio 810 as well, and is now working among his many jobs as, uh, as color analyst for Chicago Fire FC, is our good buddy Tony Miola. Tony, how you doing, man? What's up, guys? I love when I hear someone say Sports Radio 810. It just brings <laughs> back really, really good memories. Good to see you guys. It's always good to see uh, your face and, and to hear your voice. And you're, you're busy with counterattack. You're busy doing the, the Chicago games. How's that been so far, by the way, doing the fire games this year? Yeah, it's been great. I, I, I think I may have mentioned to you uh, when, when you and I were texting in the beginning of me taking this job, I never really thought of working at a club, you know, because everything I'd done was uh, at the national level and for no other reason other than that's kind of where I got thrown into it. And I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying the fact that you really only have to study one team every game instead of studying <laughs> two new teams yeah. all the time. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, what I enjoy about this broadcast, and it was a, uh, something that um, we talked about right at the start, and it was the only way I was really going to do it, was they wanted a national feel to the broadcast. Of course, it's the stories and the pregame and all that stuff is, is generally stories about, um, you know, Chicago, Chicago fire players, that type of stuff. But when you're calling a game, you got to call it straight, you know, and whatever you see. And uh, I think as, as a league, we've gotten uh, so much better at that than it was back in the day. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was Homerville uh, every game in, <laughs> in the 1990s and the early 2000s, you know, and, now I listen to games. I listen to you guys. You guys do a great job, and you're calling a game. It, it is what it is, and I think people understand that guys make a mistake. And, by the way, guys on the home team make a mistake as well, you know, and that's mm -hmm. that, and that was, that was their uh, – the first thing they basically said to me is we want people to really sort of feel that this is a national broadcast. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, of course – would have been a lot more fun to visit stadiums this year and, you know, get the, like, I would have preferred to have been in Kansas city this weekend and seen you guys and seen some friends. I will get to that point one day, but short of that, um, I couldn't have really asked for much more. Well, I was just going to ask you, having it be your first season covering or, you know, doing uh, color work for the Chicago fire and there's no fans It's an entirely different MLS season, all of the, you know, peaks and valleys that have occurred over the last few months. What's that been like for you and, and just all, kind of rolling with the punches? Well, you guys have a little bit of an advantage having some fans in the stadium, right? So you can, you can feel some energy um, in the stadium when you get there and you know, fans are excited. Like that part I miss because, um, you, you, you know, you kind of, you, you know, you feed off of that. And of course I've called CONCACAF games for uh, a year now, you know, so I'm used to <laughs> sitting there and trying to always create your own energy, but, um, it's, it's gotten a little bit easier with the team getting some results of late, uh, seven points in the last three games. And it was getting, I think a little bit frustrating for fans and a little bit frustrating for, uh, maybe some of the players, but credit to them. They, they didn't let it get to them where, they were creating chances in games and the ball just wouldn't find the back net. And I'm sure there's some sporting fans going, Oh boy, that story sounds familiar right now, <laughs> you know, but that's kind of where we, that's kind of where this group was at. Um, and it's nice to see, I would think in, in any, you know, any team you follow, it's nice to see that some of those things that you're working on and some of the hard work is paying off. Uh, it, I was going to ask you, you know, Chicago making a lot of, uh, a lot of moves uh, with the new ownership coming in, obviously bringing yourself in and, and what you said they've done in terms of really supporting the broadcast, um, the move back to Soldier Field. It seems kind of like a, a new, you know, new era in Chicago. Uh, can you get a sense of what the city feels about the fire right now? Or is it too tough to tell without any, you know, with, with everything else going on? No, I'm, I'm around the city all the time. I've, I've uh, walked this river walk more than probably anybody in Chicago since I've been here. And, uh, 
there's there's a general excitement. Of course, it's a big city. As you guys know, it's a sports town. They want to win, and they want to win, you know, yesterday. That's what the, that's what the city wants to do. Um, and, again, I think, I, you know, as I said, a little bit of frustration when you don't get the – wins right away um and i think a little bit of uh, a little sense of relief after the last couple of games where you're picking up some points but you mentioned it uh, change in ownership right which has been massive for the club a move to downtown offices which are stunning these offices here um, a move to soldier field which no one really thought was going to happen because there was such a long lease at sea geek stadium you know, you have to be a really committed owner to go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to swallow that pill and we're going to make this work in Soldier Field and we're going to figure it out. And then you top that off with a new manager, uh, 17 changes at the beginning of the year, one more that's expected to come in sometime in the near future, a youngster from Columbia right back. And now you're thinking, man, they're, they're, they're really committed, you know, they're really committed to doing this. And I think as a fan, I mean, you guys are, our fans, I'm sure of whether you're a Royals fan or whether you're a Chiefs fan, whatever, you want your ownership groups to, you want to feel that they're invested in what you're doing, that they're, they care about the team. And more often than not, the only way that we think owners are committed to the teams are when they spend money, right? We're all, we're all good at spending every owner's money, right? It doesn't matter if you're a Chiefs fan. I was in Kansas city for nine years, I spent Lamar Hunt's money both with the Kansas City Wizards and the Chiefs all the time, you know, that's, that's how I felt about it. But, but, that's, but that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a committed owner, and I think that is, that is uh, resonating for sure. Hey, Tony, so let's talk about the, the coach, uh, Rafa, as you mentioned. Um, we, we got to see him a little bit with the U-17s. He worked with Busio there. You know him well. What's – the transition to coaching, what's uh, coaching Chicago Fire, what's he been like so far for you guys? Yeah, he's, he's really, really well liked, Nate. He really is. Um, I think he has a very um, simple philosophy about the game. Um, p- possess the ball, but possess it with some purpose. You know, the, the, the word possession is kind of a weird one in our sport, right? Because, uh, you know, it, it sometimes misleads you uh, in the game, but it's possess it with some purpose. Um, he, he's, he's all about bringing high quality people into the organization, high quality players on the field and off the field. And I think both of those things that are, are starting to bear fruit a little bit for this team. And uh, he's just, a, he's one, it's just a likable guy, you know, I mean, I, I met him, um, I, I think, two years ago when he first took over the 17s, maybe a year and a half ago, I don't even know what the months are anymore, but um, he's, he's one of those guys, unlike probably you or me, Nate, he's got no enemies, you know, he's one of those guys got no enemies (laughs) and and he seems like that kind of guy. And um, he's been a real joy to be around. I really enjoy, we're lucky um, as you guys are there with Peter, where you have a relationship where you can sit and talk to him and get some ideas. And I, I love uh, j- just talking, talking the game with them, you know, not necessarily just Chicago, but, you know, there's been like uh, Europa League games and Champions League games that have been on on certain days and you have a conversation with them. I, I just enjoy the conversation. So uh, I think they're, they're happy here that they have him. Um, and I think he's done a, a really good job so far. Tony, what about from the players' standpoint? How have they bought into this? And, you know, you mentioned earlier, kind of a rough start to the season, but now finding that rhythm and momentum. So do you see this team on the, on the brink of something special here, just given what they've overcome this season and some of the challenges uh, with all these new pieces coming together early on? Well, the, the most in, impressive thing for me has been the fact that they didn't abandon um, their, their tactical principles. They're the same team that they were that lost a, a series of games uh, that they shouldn't. And I think I was telling you guys uh, off air, the, the NYCFC game was probably their poorest performance. And I think that one ended up 3-1. I could, might, it might have been 3-0. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was, a, it was not a good performance. Outside of that, you could go to stretches of every game since MLS is back and go, we came out of games. And how'd they lose that game? You know, but that's, that's, as you guys know, that's what a team is, you know, and it takes a little while to build that 
But as far as the performances, like they were probably easy videotapes to cut up for, because, you know, coaches, <laughs> when you want your team to feel good, you cut the videotape up in a way where you're like, you, you come out of that meeting, you're like, oh, we were really great, but, but how did we lose three nothing? You know, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> you could have cut those videotapes up and, and really showed some good stuff. And, and then the last three games, I mean, it, it really, the difference has been the balls hit the back of the net. There's been no change in style. And that's been the most impressive thing for me because I was trying to put myself in the, the, the player shoes, put yourself in the locker room and go, how would you react to this? You can imagine there's got to be some guys that would react in a different way, right? So, man, I can't believe we're losing this stinks, you know, and you get down to training. I didn't, I didn't see any of that um, to be honest uh, with the group. And, and I think that's why there wasn't really a change in tactics. Uh, there was a change in formation with shifting two players that has really helped but as far as the style of play, tactical principles, where they press, all that stuff, that none of that has changed. So they're on, they're on a bit of a roll right now, Tony. I mean, anytime you pick up seven points over three games, I think you have to be happy uh, with that. Um, what are some, for Sporting KC fans, who are some of the players that they need to, to take and keep an eye out on in this game? Well, the, the one guy, obviously, is, is Robert Barrett, right? Anytime you get a goal scorer, uh, five games in a row now, he's got six goals on the season. Um, he's been outstanding uh, for them. Francisco Calvo, their captain, who f just got a contract extension this week for another year, um, has been outstanding for them. And I know he's had his detractors over the years, and he has uh, he's overcome a lot of that stuff. And I think because – uh, they've they've simplified things for him in the back. Um, and, and Rafa Wiki, some of his comments last week uh, when he got the contract extension and said, you know, I just want him to be a defender first. I don't need him to be a playmaker. I need him to be a defender first, which is refreshing to hear because I always say on the radio, you know, when they talk about a defender, say, what do you think about this defender? They say, well, he's great at building out of the back, you know, <laughs> or what do you think about this goalkeeper? Like, oh, he's so good with his feet. Yeah, but can he defend or can he keep the ball out of the net? That's the two main important things, you know. Um, Georgie Mihailovic, I'm sure your fans uh, know, um, is a youngster that, that is still is not close to the ceiling yet for him. Um, he does some really special things. Um, Aliceta, from a Chicago standpoint, um, who's now I'm assuming he's going to play out wide again. Um, when he gets 1v1, he's got one thing in mind, and that's to attack and attack and attack. And then Fabian, Fabian Erbers has been great. Gastoni Menez won't be with the team. Uh, he has been a, a great net, that true number six role. The guy who's been more the eight has been Medran in the middle of the field. I would assume if uh, Stojanovic didn't get hurt during MLS's back, uh, Medran would have been the 10. Um, in this uh, in this system, but he's been great in the number eight role. Real calm on the ball, um, can change direction. I mean, they've got. The, I, I would I would look at this team and just say they have solid players all around. Um, that's kind of how I would describe this team. There's no. I wouldn't say there's a real superstar. There's not a Carlos Vela in the team. There's not a guy like that. I mean, you guys, you guys, although Polito won't be there, you, you have like a, a, you have like a guy that can turn the game on its head. Um, I would say this is, this is more of a, a team that's dependent on each other, right. To, to perform well. They, they, of course, you're always going to get that moment of, of magic from someone in a game and Madron, a, a run for 60 yards a couple games ago, as you probably saw um, and scores a goal, but I, I, I would, I would think that in order for this team to keep going and, and, and getting points, they have to play well as a team because they don't have that Vela guy. You know, they don't have um, some of the guys of Valeri, you know, those types of guys. But that doesn't mean you can't win. Um, you can win like that, and we've seen that. Hey, Tony, before we let you go, you mentioned that they, they made a little switch in terms of players. Uh, what can you tell us about that? What, what switch did they make, and, and why did it make a big difference? Well, Aliceta was playing as the number 10, um, and Fabian Erbers and Mihailovic were out wide in, in the two wide positions. And uh, they moved Fabian Erbers into the number 10 position because they thought that they would get more support defensively because he's a, he's a high work rate guy. Um, where Aliceta, um, in that role, 
it's he's a, he's an attacking player. You want him to do most of his workload when they've when they've got the ball, not when they don't have the ball. So they thought from that standpoint it would help. Well, it certainly did. But what it's done is opened up a whole new world for uh, Fabian Herbers to run into a whole new world for him to be part of the attack. Um, and it's really changed the, the, the dynamic nature of going forward. Um, and, and I don't know that they thought, Nate, that it, that, was gonna, that part was going to happen the way that it did. I think they were looking at it more from a defensive standpoint, but it's opened up a whole new world for Herbers to, uh, to get forward and run in behind the back four. And um, so it's been interesting to watch. Sometimes you just fall in those things, right? Is sometimes, yep. you know, um, in New England, they, they, uh, the Patriots one day had a great quarterback and he gets <laughs> hurt and all of a sudden they found out that there was this other guy. <laughs> yep. You know, it's the, how, how things happen, right? No, no doubt about it. Sometimes it happens out of necessity and, and uh, it, it, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's going to be a fun game tomorrow night. Tony, we wish you were here too. We'd have well, a glass Nate, of wine. Can I jump in oh, wait, oh, really likes, quick? Go ahead, Allie. Like come on. i do this. Because, Tony, I was thinking the last time we talked, I believe we were breaking down the 2000 MLS Cup championship where uh, yeah, the Wizards right. beat Chicago. So I'm curious now, as you're in this new role, do you ever let them, do you, you ever let them forget it, that that was uh, your MLS <laughs> Cup championship came against this club? That's do you try to sneak point. it in the broadcast? Well, I, that, I, I don't let them forget that, nor do I let them forget 2004 uh, final at Arrowhead Stadium in the U.S. Open Cup. Uh, yeah. Igor uh, Simotenkov, right? A, uh, yeah. a gold. No, I, uh, I, I don't let them forget. I, I like <laughs> to play uh, coy a little bit, but I, when I have to, I pull it out of the bag, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's right tony very important note to end <laughs> yeah, on there <laughs> yeah that's important tony hey thanks so much for the time we wish we were Anytime. hanging out with you after the game tomorrow night but we like will you said, we will we'll be back to it soon yep and, and and we'll be looking forward to listening to you on counterattack as well with dunny thanks guys i appreciate it all right that's tony miola we'll be back to wrap things up on this edition of the sporting kansas city show right after this all right, back to wrap things up on another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show. Nate Katie, Ali Trost, and Carter Augustine. Our thanks to both Tom Marshall and uh, Tony Miola for joining us on the show. Now it's time, guys, to just kind of look ahead to the matches that, that are to come. We, we previewed this Chicago Fire team, so maybe let's take it from the Sporting Kansas City side of things. And I, I know, Ali, you were on the conference call. Carter, you watched it today. Uh, today being Tuesday, we, we spoke with Peter Vermees. I asked him about the fact that they've had to use a lot of guys on their bench already this year. They've had injuries. They've had a weird schedule. And does that help in terms of the fact that they're probably going to have to be rel relying on some of these guys in the middle of this stretch? This, this, this game is our first Wednesday where I hope you don't have any plans on Wednesday, guys, the rest of the month of October because they're nope. <laughs> all sporting Kansas City games, darn it. Um, he said, yeah, it's great that they all have experience, but they need to now have that experience to go out and use that experience to get results. So I'm curious, Allie, what you think of the depth that sporting has right now and what are you looking forward to most in terms of that squad rotation uh, going into this stretch? Yeah, it's not just the depth for me. It's, it's the versatility within those roles and within those positions that a lot of these players have had to kind of step in and, you know, you've seen Busio at the six, you've seen Graham Zussi play all over the field at this point. And to me, the, the key word in, in Vermees' press conference earlier was in-game adjustments. You put out your best starting roster your best team on the field to start the game and then as the game progresses you recognize what adjustments need to be made to finish the game hopefully with a win uh, and adjust to tactically what the other team is putting out there for you and so for me the depth of the roster is great but it's also the experience that a lot of players have had playing different roles Kyrie Shelton at, at the nine out on the wing you know Johnny Russell and Gerso kind of switching roles uh, out on the wings even though Johnny's uh, you know predominantly been out on the right but just the, the versatility within the roles on the field that you know a lot of these players have been kind of asked to just step in and, and depending on what the game is throwing at them step into different roles and, and perform at a high level so I think for me uh, what's going to be interesting to see is you know this team over the next month and, and during this really congested stretch of games find ways to win and, and especially when you take Alan Polito out of the mix you're going to see different looks up top you're going to see different looks in the midfield and and whether that's because of caution accumulation like we saw with Gadi Kinda being out now he returns of course but 
injuries and different reasons that keep players out of the game has just made other players have to be better, whether that's in the roles that they typically are used to playing or roles that they are not maybe uh, playing at a, at a consistent on a consistent basis. So I think for me, it's going to be really interesting to see how this roster continues to just kind of be flexible and very fluid over this next stretch. And, and again, against the Chicago fire team that, you know, Tony Miola said has found their rhythm in the last couple of games. So it's not going to be a walk in the park by any means. So Carter, I want to ask you about this as well, because I, I think one thing for us that are, if we're diehard sporting Kansas city fans, it's a little scary seeing the young guys play, but it's also kind of exciting, right? You get a chance to see how the young kids look when they get thrown into the mix. And one of the things Peter said in his answer was, yeah, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something to the effect of, yeah, a lot of these guys that have already gotten experience are going to get called on, and some other guys are going to get opportunities as well. And the first thing I thought of was the team that you do the play-by-play -play for, Swope Park Rangers, they've got a lot of academy kids and some guys that have been signed to MLS deals as well that have been playing minutes for them, and their season's over now. I'm just curious. I wonder if we're going to see anybody else when he says other guys. I, and, and I'm curious where your thoughts go when, when you think about that. And, um, and I guess just your opinion on or, or your, your, your expectations of what we're going to see the rest of this season. Um, I think it's, it might be difficult with COVID to add guys up from, from the Rangers. So, you know, you, you have to think maybe Tyler Freeman gets a little bit more involved with the, with the first team now that the, the Rangers, the SKC two season is, uh, is over. Um, for me, it was more like if a sense of they're going to have to use the whole roster during this time. And I think they're right now, it's maybe the reinforcements have arrived. You've got Ilias back in, and into fitness now. Um, we saw Roger Espinosa come on and make a really good cameo down in Houston and, and kind of add his typical bite into the game. Um, Winston Reed now seems to be re reaching a fitness level as well. So I think um, as you were asking Nate, asking him is during the summer, the, the, some of the other guys like a Felipe Hernandez come in, uh, Graham Smith play a lot of minutes and, and hold the fort. And during this stretch, I think they'll be called on again. So um, I, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll see a little more Eric Hurtado than we've seen. Um, Maybe some, maybe a return of Jalen Lindsay at some point here, because you know Graham Zusi can't. You can't imagine he's going to play every single match Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So Daniel uh, Shallowy was back on the bench last Daniel game. Daniel was back in, so then maybe that's the one. You know, he, we haven't mm -hmm. seen a whole lot of him this year, so maybe he's he he's maybe itching for some minutes. So um, yeah, I think I think just with this schedule congestion, um, they'll be hoping that some of those those minutes that they played in August will really come to fruition when they need them. Here again. Did I call them Swole Park Rangers too? Did I do the same thing? Maybe. I mean, I do it all the time. <laughs> I, I, it's going to take a while. It, it's a transition year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's still the Rangers KC in my heart. Too. There we go. Um, and, and then, guys, how about let's just get a quick thought on Nashville coming up. Uh, Mike Jacobs is the guy that's putting that team together. Uh, we haven't had a chance to see them yet. Carter, your thoughts on uh, just how maybe it's kind of fun to see a brand new franchise uh, that's going to be coming to town here. Yeah, it'll be it'll be fun to to see. Um, obviously, they're they're hanging in around the the last playoff spot there in the East. Um, and Mike Jacobs know him pretty well, and you know it's a shame that it's not the the normal um, travel circumstances, so he couldn't uh, couldn't hang out or anything like that. But um, I, I'm just excited to see some Eastern Conference teams. That'll be really interesting. And for me, another thing that sticks out is Amadou Dia in his press conference today, when asked about Chicago Fire, he said, you know, we're really thinking about how we let down the fans in the last two home games. And we want mm -hmm. to, we want to, we, I think he said they owe it to the fans to, to deliver a performance at home. So that, that really stood out to me, Allie. Yeah, no, I, I thought that that was a pretty um, telling thing because we've talked a lot this season about oh like home field advantage it just doesn't seem to mean as much anymore and you know it's such an unusual season there's inconsistencies across the league with who's having fans who's not but you know if there's one thing that Sporting KC fans should by now know about this team is that they want to put on a good performance for their fans every single time they play at home and truly do consider the fans whether it's you know just 2,000 or you know a packed stadium to be in you know an influential part 
in their performance and, and the support that they bring, uh, you know, week in and week out. So hopefully, you know, the team can give the fans that because I know it hasn't always been easy at home. But, you know, just as we talked about with the Chicago team, the Sporting KC team is seeming to find their rhythm as well. And even if, if Alan Polito is not there for, you know, most of this month, I think that, you know, Nate, like you said earlier, the depth on this roster and the experience that this team has now, whether it's the youngest players or the veterans and, and the experience playing with different, you know, lineups and different rotations of players will only make them better down the stretch. And so that's going to be, I think, a key part in their success here as we get closer to the playoffs. A big thing, being in third place right now, puts you in a decent position, hold the fort, keep yourself in playoff position until Polito comes back. And then all of a sudden, if you're a full strength team with Alan Polito going into the postseason, you got to feel pretty good about things if you're sporting Kansas City. All right, that's going to do it for us, guys. Our thanks again to Tom Marshall and Tony Miola for joining us. Ali Trost and Carter Augustine. This is Nate Bucati saying thanks for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week, hopefully talking about two big wins on the next edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show.